today we're going to be continuing on the subject of the gifts to the church. We've already went through two, but before we we go there, we need to do a quick recap. One, the gift of the church. The gifts of the church all do the same thing. They all equip the saints for the work of the ministry. They all bring in the unity and they all bring in the maturity, which is why these drive through chapels, these drive through churches aren't real churches. Secondly, we find the gifts of the church in Ephesians chapter 4. In verse 11, and he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. And then we went through what the apostle is and what the prophet is. And today we're going to be picking up on pastors so the pastor has the responsibility as the under shepherd to lead to to lead the church on, on the everyday hands-on experience they are at ground zero all the time see the pastor is to shepherd the people. Now, Jesus is the good shepherd, but the pastor is the person that Jesus put there on the earth to where he can shepherd through the pastor. What the pastoral role is not. See, a lot of people treat their pastor in a certain way which is not the way that the pastor is supposed to be treated. And they are expecting the pastor to do things that the pastor is not supposed to do, but what the congregation itself as a body, as a whole, as a family themselves should automatically do. Pastor says, I remember when I was a candidate at a church in Ohio, we went and preached the word and prayed around the altar. Then the congregation were going to ask questions. It was a great move of the spirit of the spirit. God showed up. Then the questions began. And then he gives us an example of what the questions are. Here are a few of them. Pastor, when it snows, will you come and shovel me out? The pastor First off, why can't you shovel yourself? Secondly, if you are unable to, why don't you find somebody that can? The job of the pastor is not to shovel you out of your driveway and shovel you out of your house. That is not his job and that is not what God put him there for. Pastor, I can't get out much. Will you come and take me to the supermarket each day? The job of the pastor is not to take you to the supermarket. If you can't do it, find somebody that can. Ask somebody in the congregation who has the gift of service if they can and would be willing to do it. But first off, you need to remember that they have a family too, so you can't always expect them to drop what they're doing. But when they have the time, somebody with the gift of service, when we get into motivational gifts, man, they would love to help you out. But the pastor is not somebody that's going to shovel you out of your driveway and out of your house. They are not going to pick you up to take you to the supermarket. They have a church to run. They have tons of people with real needs that need prayer, that need counseling and all that stuff and they don't have time to deal with that nonsense. Pastor, I get lonely. 
Will you be coming each week to tea to have tea and cookies with me? That is not what the pastor does. If you get lonely, man, the some of the best times you can have is when you're lonely because then you can get a true connection to focus on your relationship with God. Man, if you're feeling lonely, spend time with Jesus. But don't expect the pastor to drop what he's doing when you feel lonely to come spend time with you. Now, is it good to have a relationship with the pastor? Yes. But that is not the job of the pastor. Pastor says, my answer to each question was no. To say the least, I did not get the votes needed to become the pastor of that church. Why? The church was abusing the gift of the pastor. Pastor said no, so they found somebody who would do the job, which isn't the job of the pastor, which is why my pastor created something called Empowering Pastors to help, help these pastors out to where they would stop being abused well, and, one, learn their job, uh, try to get the job in that direction, if the church didn't want to, then fine, they can go pastor someplace else. But pastor wants to help pastors become the best that they could be and not just drop out of the ministry. The church at large lost the reason for having a pastor. One of the, these is denominationalism. God never created denominations. Denominations is segregating the church. And that is a real spirit. To create division where there should be unity to where the body can move as a whole. In most denominations, the pastor does not have the freedom, the pastor, but is more of a puppet. Your pastor should never... Be a puppet. If your pastor is being treated like a puppet, man, talk to the board. Try to get them in the true path to where the pastor is the leader, not the board. If the board doesn't want to go in that direction, then just stop going to that church and find a church that will treat the pastor the way that pastors should be treated. They are a gift. They are not a puppet. Pastor tells another story. I remember when I was on the road as an evangelist that the Holy Spirit told me to go to a church in PA. I called the pastor, let him know that the Spirit of God told me. He replied, I know, me too. I told him that we needed to set a date. He responded with, I brought it to the board and the board said no. I resorted with a question. They control you? The board should not be controlling the pastor. That is not what God wants. The only thing that the board should do is vote on certain things to where the pastor goes up like, okay, this is what I want to do with the do with the church, but I cannot pass it without voting with the board. The board shouldn't control the pastor. They should only vote on certain things. And that's about it. But when it comes to true to the church truly being led, the pastor is to be the head, not the board. In the majority of denominations, not everyone, not everyone, the boards of the church control the pastor in local churches. This neuters the local pastor from vision and obedience to God first. So with the board leading, what it's really doing 
is making it to where the pastor cannot hear from God and do what God wants. So in other words, the board is cutting off what God wants from the church and that is why that church is dead. Why? It stops. The, it neuters the local pastor from vision and obedience to God first. Instead, it becomes board first. Oh, well, we're the board. We'll just hear from God and let you know, Pastor, if... No, you are out of order if that's the way that you are running things. The head of the church, of that church, is to be the pastor, and the head of the pastor is to be Christ, not the board. And the head of the board should be the pastor. Why? Because the head of the church is the pastor. And the board should be under the pastor. Why? Because the board is part of the church. And if you are one of those people, then you are out of order. Obey the conviction of the Holy Spirit, or I command that church to be shut down within a week period of time. One day, a local church board member asked me to breakfast. I met him and we had a small talk for a bit. Then he got to the point. They were in the search of a new pastor and had ordained many or obtained many resumes. When a candidate came in, they would tell me what the vision was and I asked if he could work in the vision. I looked at him and told him that the whole process was backwards and not biblical. Now, that's what pastor said. Oh, well, the vision of the church is this, pastor. No, the pastor is to have the vision, and the church is to get behind the vision, not the other way around. In many bashing denominations... Okay, I am not bashing denominations. If they are being governed by the word of God, the word is our guide not a religious organization. The word of God is to be the guide, not what the church tries to claim. Now, if it's already biblical, man, that is okay. If it's heading in a biblical direction, then fine. But if it is not, then it is out of order. Vision. One major responsibility of a local church is hearing the voice of God for the direction of the church. Every church should have a vision that the pastor himself hears from God to take it to. That is the right order of things. And if your church does not have a vision, as I already said it is not heading in the proper direction why it's hard to hit a target you can't see it's impossible to hit a target you don't have that is why every church should have a vision everybody in the congregation should know the vision to get behind the vision and push towards having the vision happen psalms 133. Alright, well, I guess it's the whole thing. I don't know. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for, for brethren to dwell together in unity. Vision brings unity. It is like the precious oil up on the head running down on the beard of the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending up on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing forevermore. Proverbs 29:18. Where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. But happy is he who keeps the law. 
Habakkuk 2, 2 through 3. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak, and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. <laughs> Where there is no vision, the people are running around like a chicken with its head cut off, and it is not pretty. You have to have the vision, or everybody will just be running around doing their own thing like a chicken with its head cut off, not knowing what is what and why these things are. God deposits the vision in the spirit of the pastor. That is why I say the board shouldn't come up with a vision. The pastor needs to hear from God. Because God deposits the vision in the spirit of the pastor. And then the pastor goes around and deposits it to the congregation. And even the board. The pastor needs to write it, make it clear, cast it, and... Through time, it will manifest in the local church. Now, the Bible says, write the vision, make it clear on tablets. So anyone can read it, can run with it. So one, the pastor needs to hear from God. Two, the pastor needs to write it down. And three, the pastor needs to deposit it to the congregation. This is the job of the pastor. The vision does not come from the board, as I already said. It does not come from a friend. The vision must be conceived in the heart of the pastor and through the gesturing period all the way to delivery. The pastor propels God's purpose in the local church. <laughs> See, this is one of the problems that I have with denominational churches. Now, not all denominational churches are bad. Some of them have the right order of things. And those that do, God bless them. Those that don't, get in order or your church is going to be dead and eventually have its door closed. And man, I am commanding that to happen because you're really not doing the body of Christ. Christ any favor with trying to run your church out of order because you're just giving the church a bad name. So bless those that are doing it right man and for those that are not please just get in order because it is not good for you to be doing it that way. And you're hurting more people than you're really ha helping by the way that you are being out of order. The pastor is then to fulfill those three main purposes designed by Jesus in the vision that has been birthed. Equip the saints to fulfill the vision through the word. Equip the saints for the work of the ministry, in other words. Bring the church in the unity of the vision through the word. Once again, bring the church into unity. And then bring the body to, mature, to a maturity level that is of... The, the, so they are mature enough to help build and strengthen the vision through the word. In other words, bring the church to maturity. Once again, all three things. If the pastor is not accomplishing these principles, then they might be a nice person, but they need to get to where you will fulfill God's purpose individually and corporately. And of course, if the board is doing it, try to bring the board into the level or just leave the church and start one with the vision that God births in your heart. This way, you can still do your job that God has prepared you to do, but you don't have anyone holding you back now. Accountability. 
Every person must be accountable. If you are not accountable to anyone, then you are an illegitimate child. And the only thing you can produce is illegitimate children in the spirit. So you must be accountable and, of course, accountable to somebody that is also under accountability. If a person is in authority, they need to be under authority. You have to be under authority to have authority. The police, they are under the state or the governor. The governor, he's under somebody else. All the way up to the president who is under the people of the United States of America. If a person is not under authority, then they are a rogue and very dangerous. You are dangerous when you are not under authority. And of course, if you are in a church, you are attending a church, the person spiritually you should be under is your pastor. Which means he can correct you even if it offends you and you must obey him. If you're not, if you don't, then you're not really under the pastor. You are illegitimate. You are a fatherless. You are fatherless. Therefore, you produce fatherless. Which is not a good thing and is not in the biblical order of things. Pastor tells the story. There was a pastor who came to town and swooped in and grabbed a few families from the church. He invited him to breakfast because he wanted to know who he was. He told, told him the church he came from in another state. Then the organization he was ordained through. Then his oversight. When he got, when pastor got home, the research began. There was no church in the other state, so the person lied. The ordain, ordaining organization never even heard of him. The oversight had not talked with him in three years. And of course, the oversight also what didn't have an oversight, so pastor said, huh, illegitimate, producing illegitimate, of course he used another name for that, which I'm not going to say, not that there's anything wrong with, because it is King James, but still, a pastor or minister with no oversight is a dangerous weapon, why, they can get off, in doctrine, and they don't have anybody to bring them back. It's exactly what happened to John Alexander Dowie. Man, he was a great man, had great miracles, but then he started getting off doctrine. And the only people he had around him was yes men. Plus, he actually had somebody come in Mary Woodworth Etter. She could have helped him out, but he, he saw something, decided it was not a god when it was, and it's you can actually prove it through the Bible, completely cut her off. If he never cut her off, he would have stayed on doctrine all the way to the end and wouldn't, wouldn't have even had what had the ending that he ended up with. And John Alexander Dowie, another one, he got off doctrine. Do, two, he got off the Great Commission by trying to build the city of Zion. Because the church is called to be in the world, but not of the world. We are to be in the world to spread the gospel worldwide. And John Alexander Dowie got off that. Because when you don't have an oversight... You don't have anybody to keep you on track. All right, so they can, all right. They can easily go off doctrine or moral error. 
without accountability, which was the remainder of what I started, and I kind of finished it without even knowing it. I should, I could have just read it, but it's okay. I managed to get a little bit farther in. Peter was accountable to the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15. The Gentiles were getting saved, and he made sure he brought it to the oversight of the church because they were being led by the Spirit of God. They confirmed that Peter was what Peter was moving into. So even in the book of Acts, we see Peter was accountable. And then, of course, Peter himself also had other people he, that he was even accountable to who he had for his accountability. Everyone needs accountability. Ask your pastor whom he or she is accountable to. And I don't have to do that because my pastor already made it clear. One, he has Ted Shuttlesworth Sr. And two, he also has Bishop Rick Thomas and, of course, Bishop Rick Thomas has people he's accountable for, or he's accountable to also. Why? Accountability is a good thing. I consider Pastor Spencer one of my accountabilities. Another one, Pastor Banfield. Man, even my third, Pastor Chad. So I am overly accountable. Evangelist. Now we're getting into what I know God has called me to be. The definition of evangelist is one that teaches the body of Christ who to announce the good news of Jesus Christ. Evangelism is a process of telling news, announcing it. News, announcing. An evangelist is a gift to the church to teach and train the body to tell, announce the good news of Jesus to this world and that is my job now i'm not officially an evangelist yet why because one i have not yet been ordained i have gone to bible college i have gotten training and one of the things that i'm now working on is one I'm praying to God for a good paying job in the ministry. I'm actually going to be talking to Pastor Obi about that. And tell you the truth, it's really not about the money. No, when I, when I talk to him and whatever I end up getting paid, so be it as long as I am doing something in with eternal value as my second job. All right. The initial con job concept of an evangelist is one who swoops in the town, sets up some meeting for for being for being to be saved and healed. For okay, meetings for for being saved and healed. This is one of the activities of an evangelist, but that is only an evidence of the calling, but not the responsibility in of itself. The calling of an evangelist is to equip the work for the ministry, to bring to unity of faith, and to bring to maturity. The fivefold ministry gifts have the same responsibility, but through the anointing gifts, they are given, they are given, they do it in a different manner. Remember the five food groups. All have the same purpose. Just do it in a different manner. And that's exactly what the fivefold ministry gifts are. They are just like the fivefold five food groups, but for the church. The teacher, the pastor, the evangelist, the apostle, and the evangelist all five or prophet all five they do the same thing just in a different manner plus the evangelist also goes out and gets the one that wandered away so the question would be is a person an evangelist who swoops in the town 
Does a few meetings leaves and the people are not empowered to do the work of the ministry? Mm. If you have an evangelist doing that, not a real evangelist. If the people of God are not equipped to duplicate, then what was the meeting? If the people are not being brought to a focus of the vision, then what was the meaning? If the people were not matured in their faith in Christ, then what was the meaning? Mm. Well, they made me feel good. Okay, what did they do for you? Well, nothing. They just made me feel good. Not a real evangelist. We do not need more meetings. We need the empowering impartation of the anointed evangelist to ignite the passion for soul winning in the local body of believers. The evangelist, man, he's supposed to set you on fire to go out and win the lost. If they are not doing that, then what are they doing? They're doing nothing but making you feel good all the way down to hell. That is, unless you manage somehow to have been saved. But then, what are you taking to heaven with you? Well, what are you talking about? If you're not going out soul winning, if you don't, and if the evangelist is not igniting you to go out and win the lost, who then what can you take with you? The only thing you can take with you is another soul. When evangelist is long gone from the location. The impartation should still be burning in the heart of the people. Philip did the work of an evangelist. Acts 4, 8. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria, preached Christ to them. And the multitudes, with one accord, heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in the city. Acts 21 8. On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip, the evangelist who was one of the seven and stayed with him. Timothy was instructed to do the work of the evangelist. Now, Timothy was also a pastor. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will, will judge the living and the dead at his appearing, and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince and rebuke. Exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endear sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears. They will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. So, Timothy, as a pastor, was told also to do the work of an evangelist. Take the gospel out of the church. And on top of that, prepare the people to where they can go out and soul win and ignite the fire in them. 
So the evidence of an evangelist are that souls will be saved, bodies will be healed, devils will be cast out. But these are evidence. They are not the main responsibility. Now we're going to get into the last one for the gift of the church. But before I do, they already took out the apostle. They already took out the prophet. But now the next thing that the church is trying to move away from is the evangelist. Trying to say, oh well, the evangelists aren't needed anymore. So then what's next? The next one after evangelists that they want to try to take out is the pastor. They're already disrespecting their pastors. And once the pastor is gone, all that's left is teacher. And once teacher is gone, then they then the church completely moved away from all that God put in. You need all five five ministries in order to keep the church strong and in order to keep the church healthy. If you don't, if you don't, then the church will completely cease being the church. I mean, for the most part, the majority of churches have ceased being a church and just want motivational messages to make them feel good. And that is not what the church is for, man. One, the Bible says the gospel is offense to many, but is life to those who hear it. You choose to hear it. And a lot of people, man, they don't want to hear it. Why? Because it convicts them of their sins. And sadly in the church... The same thing is beginning to start going on. And we need to stop that and need to start being the church again. Because, man, they are, there are way too many people going to hell. And that means all five-fold ministries. So let's get into the last one. This ministry gift has the ability to break down the Word of God in such a way that through the anointing, the verses are greatly understood. They have the gift to explain and reveal the scriptures in a manner that the light bulb goes on for those who have never understood before. Man, teachers, man, they can make you understand things that you could read a thousand times and just not get, but sit under them. Bam! Makes sense. The first teacher pastor came across... And contact with was a pa as a pastor came to teach on finances. Pastor preached a whole month on finances before he arrived. He taught on tithing, seating, giving alms. The topics were covered in detail from the pulpit before he came to town. When he came and started to teach the word on giving and, and receiving, the people started sharing. How blessed they were by the teacher. They kept saying, this was the first time they ever heard and understand this teaching. Pastor was a little ticked off, truthfully, because the same messages had just been preached that whole month before he came. The difference? He was called in the fivefold ministry as a teacher and the anointing on his life to unfold the principles and release impartation to equip. Bringing the unity and bringing the maturity were different from the pastor. So they had different results. See, pastor preached a whole entire month. Then a teacher comes. All of a sudden, light bulb. That is why. Teachers are very important. The pastor can preach. 
the apostle can preach. The evangelist can preach. The prophet can preach. But sometimes you just need a teacher. And of course, from all fivefold fold of these things, different things will set off different light bulbs under the same exact teachings, bringing more of a revelation than what you would have just got if you only had one. And that is why each of these things are very important. A carrot does not come from the same nutritional values as a cucumber. But they are both vegetables from the same field. They serve together to enhance the health of the person partaking. And it is the same exact thing for the fivefold ministry gifts. They all bring different nutritions in the spiritual realm. The teacher is not better than the other ministry gifts with the word. But how they dissect, distribute, and bring nutrition to the body is different. Therefore, the whole is built healthy. If you don't have all fivefold ministry gifts, man, your church is not going to be healthy. Well, what do you mean? If you eat meat all the time and no vegetables, your body is not getting all the vitamins it needs. Therefore, you're not going to be healthy. And it's the same with the Five-fold ministry gifts. You need all five in order to keep you healthy. We need the ministry gift of the teacher in the body of Christ to keep us safe from false doctrine. The teacher helps identify heresy that tries to creep into the church. For example, disgrace movement. Any, any teaching of grace that makes you comfortable with your sin is a heresy. Well, once saved, always saved. Not true. The Bible makes that pretty clear. As a matter of fact, let me pull out that verse right now in the book of Hebrews. All right, uh, let's see. All right, don't know exactly where it is. But it pretty much says it's impossible for those who once received, receive the teaching of truth. Uh, I'll deal with that subject on a different time. I actually need to look it up. I actually need to read it to share it. But once saved, always saved is not true. This whole entire grace thing. Oh, well, it's okay. We're under grace. No. You must confess your sins in order to be forgiven. And this whole entire grace thing. That is making you comfortable with your sin. It's not true. You have to confess your sin. If it were true, then Jesus himself wasted his time. Actually, I'll just go with what Jesus says about this.
Because he is constantly saying, repent, 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 repent. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, thus says the Lord, he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your work, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say that they are apostles and not. And you have perceived and have patience and have labored for my name's sake. And have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come and quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. In other words, I will remove your salvation. He also also he also says to another church that was lukewarm. I will vomit you out of my mouth because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold. And a, and a teacher themselves find these things, these heresies that try to creep up in the church and they prevent it from coming in. When you leave the church or ministry, the same three values should be evident. Or da la la la. Oh, wait. When they leave the church or ministry, the same three values should be evidence. The work of the ministry, equip the work of the ministry to bring the church, or the church should be brought into unity of faith, and the church should be fed the word to bring a maturity. So when they leave the church or or ministry, the same three values should be evidence. See, all three do the same exact thing. They just all, all they just do it differently. To be a healthy church, all five gifts need to be need to participate. When one is missing, the health of the body is compromised. This does not mean that each individual church has to have all five gifts resident locally. They need to be able to bring them in to release the impartation of their gifts and calling. So, in the end, all five Bring it, keep you healthy. And your church has to have all five. If you don't have all five, you're not going to be healthy. Now, does that mean that you have to have all five there on site? No, but you need to be... You need to be able to bring in that gift or those gifts that aren't there locally to where they can get all five of the... All five for their spiritual nutrition. That is why these are called the gifts of the church. They are in the spirit, the five-fold, or they are the five food groups for the spirit. One can bring the milk. The other can bring the meat. The other can bring the vegetables. The other can bring the fruit. The other can bring the dairy. Or not the dairy, the bread. Or the wheat, or whatever. But they will keep the church healthy. And your church needs to be healthy through these five-fold ministry gifts to the church. And without them, you are really going to go nowhere. And now, with that said, maybe you are watching and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Today, I want to give you that chance. The Bible says we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. 
that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And you might be saying, oh, well, it's okay. I'm a good person. No, your righteousness is as filthy rags. The Bible says that. It also makes it clear. There is only one way that you can be saved. And that is through believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus. That God raised him from the dead. Then you will be saved. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Your works can't do it. And that is why Jesus Christ came in the flesh. In the form of, of sinful flesh. Why? So he could live a sinless life to where through him we can have salvation because our flesh was corrupted. So he took on the form to make sure that he could pay it. And not, just, not his own because he was without sin. But he allowed himself in the form of sinful flesh to become sin that we could be free from sin. And that through his resurrection, we shall be saved. So all you have to do is pray this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I believe that you lived, died, and rose again. All to set me free from sin. And that also through your stripes, I can be healed. And through your stripes, I was healed. And through your resurrection, I am justified. I believe you and I accept it. And Satan, I am through with you. I want nothing more to do with you. And through Jesus Christ, you have to take your hand off me. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And Father God, for anyone that prayed that prayer right now, I pr pray a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire with evidence of tongues. Right now, be filled in Jesus' mighty name. Now, if you prayed that prayer, there are two things I want you to do. One, go to Revi revivaltoday.com, click on the Just Got Say button, fill out that information. They will send you a Bible and other material to where you don't just start the race, but you finish the race. And two, you have to get connected to a Bible-believing, Spirit-filled, Holy Ghost-moving church. With, of course, the five-fold ministry gifts to where all five are either there or they can bring them in. If you don't have one in your area, which my church, his tabernacle family church can help you find if you get in contact with them. And if of course, if you don't have one in your area, you can watch us on live stream, 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on Sundays. And on Tuesdays, Rock Solid Faith, which I kind of just went through part of the class there. Which is Tuesday nights at 7 a.m. Or not 7 a.m., 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So make sure that you get connected. Thanks for watching because, as I said, this is for your spiritual health. Thanks for watching.